The fourth video on second order modelling introduces DC servos. Now, a DC servo is a main workhorse in many engineering applications, and an understanding of how this operates is useful for all engineers, no matter what discipline you're in. Now, we're not going to look at the physics behind things like electric motive force, which is what drives a DC motor and similar concepts, but rather we're going to take the basic observations and use these to, in order to derive some simple models which explain the behaviour. Now, DC servos combine mechanical parts with electrical parts, and therefore we're going to need to use some of the insights from the earlier videos in this series. First then, let's look at a picture of a typical DC servo. And you'll see here we've used a scale electrics car because that gives a lovely view, um, there it is, of a typical DC servo and the components. You can see the magnetic field here rather crudely supplied by this big magnet. And you can see an armature or winding which is sitting inside a magnetic field. Now, typically for a DC motor, what you assume is that if there is a wire, and here it is, of known length, which is moving, and that's the key thing, it has to be moving, in a magnetic field, then you'll get a voltage generated along that wire. And the voltage depends upon the speed of movement of the wire in the magnetic field. So the type of equation you're going to get is like this one here. The voltage E is going to be some constant times dx dt, or, in this case, because we've got an armature which spins, you might want to write it as k omega, where omega is an angular velocity. Now, we're not going to worry about what the value of k is. We'll leave that to the physicist to derive and just take that this is the type of equations you get. Now, the second assumption. When a wire of known length and carrying a current I sits in a magnetic field, then a force is produced on the wire, and that force is proportional to the current. Now, because we're going to put our wire in the form of an armature sitting on an axis, then essentially all the forces are together to give a torque, and so you get an equation of this form. The torque on the armature is some k times i. Now again, we're not interested in deriving the value of k, which depends upon the magnetic field and the length of wire and the layout and other things. We're going to leave that to specialists who are really interested in such details. Now here's the final assumption, which is really valuable. We've just said that you get an equation of this form, E equals k omega, and you get an equation of this form, tor equals ki. Now, what you can show is that the k's in these two equations are the same. Obviously, that assumes perfect modelling and other sorts of things, but in terms of the type of insights that you need for simple modelling of behaviours, it's good enough, generally, just to take these two cases are the same, and that will simplify our modelling enormously. What does the DC motor look like, then? Well, first of all, let's look at the electrical part. So you'll see over here, we've got a very simple electrical circuit, a wire. Now, this funny-looking thing here is meant to represent the armature. So it's not a particularly good picture, but it doesn't matter. So it represents the armature. And you'll notice that there's a back EMF across the armature, which is generated when the armature spins in a magnetic field. You'll see there's a resistor R, and there's a current flow I, and there's a supplied voltage V. So it's fairly simple to generate an equation for this circuit, the voltage applied equals IR plus the back EMF. That's simple Kirchhoff's law. Now, what about the mechanical part? Well, the armature is generating a torque. Okay, you remember we had that equation, torque equals K times R, I. So what happens to that torque? Well, the torque is first of all applied to a flexible drive shaft. Okay? 
Now, I'm going to represent that flexible drive shaft using this box here, K. So the torque, first of all, gets applied to a shaft. Now, clearly, if that shaft is flexible, there's going to be some rotation. So I've got the torque equals the spring constant of the shaft, and there will be a rotation, which is the movement of the motor, that's theta m for motor, minus the movement at the other end, which is theta load. Now, what happens to that torque at the far end of the shaft? is it gets here and it's used to drive the load and the load could be an inertia and an in friction and the reason I've split it up here is to show that the torque is distributed between the different aspects of the load some drives the, the inertia some drives the friction now just as a note clearly the reverse operation of the DC motor is you can generate electricity if you supply a torque but that's not part of this video series so let's remind ourselves of the equations we've got. The back EMF, E equals K omega M. Omega M is the angular velocity of the motor. And the torque is given by Ki. And we used Kirchhoff's law, and we said we had V equals IR plus E, or we could have written that as IR plus K omega M. What about the mechanical part? Well, in the mechanical part, we had three bits. First of all, the torque supplied by the motor torque equals ki. We had some twist in the flexible shaft, which is torque equals k times theta m minus theta l. And finally, the torque was supplied to the load. So the torque is going to drive some friction, b omega l, and accelerate inertia, j d omega l dt. So let's put all these equations together and see what you've got. And you'll notice we've now got five equations for this simple DC servo. So what we want to do is simplify these in order to give ourselves a single ordinary differential equation because if I can reduce it to a single ordinary differential equation I can use all the insights I got for my analysis of second order systems over damping, under damping, etc, etc in order to understand the dynamics. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove the current I. So I've got five equations, I'm going to remove the variables one at a time. So you'll see an I appears here, and it appears here. So I can remove one of those I's by substituting in from one of the other equations. So what I've written is I've written tor over k equals I, and essentially I've put that in here, which gives me this equation here. V equals E plus tor over k times R. And the other three equations You'll notice I've not touched for now. So I've now gone from five equations to four, and I've reduced the variable count by one because I've got rid of i. Right, next one I'm going to do is eliminate the back EMF E. Well, you'll see that that was given there, and that's given there. So all I need to do is take that and put it in there. And you'll see this is what I've done here. I've now got the equation V equals K omega M plus tau over K times R and the other two equations I've not touched. So I've now gone from four equations to three and reduced the number of variables by one. Right, what am I going to do next? It gets a bit more tricky now, but I'm going to remove torque. Now you'll notice that torque appears in all three equations. So it's not quite so straightforward to remove, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this torque value here and put it in there and the same torque value and put it in there. So if you look at the top one, you'll see where I had tor of a k times r. There's the r of a k at the right hand side, and you'll see I've simply put in the box the tor from the bottom. And similarly, where I had tor equals k theta m minus theta l, there's the k theta m minus theta l, and you'll see I've just put the other tor value on the other side. So what I've done now is I've gone from three equations to two equations, and I've eliminated tor. Now, I can rearrange this bottom equation, see this one here, to make it just a bit more convenient. What I'm doing is I'm going to separate out the theta m term from all the theta l terms. So by rearranging it, you'll see I get this box at the bottom, k theta m equals, and I think there's something gone wrong, I'm not sure that k should be there for now. Apologise for that. Uh, k theta m equals k theta l plus b omega l plus j d omega l dt. 
Now, we've got two equations left, and what we want to do is get rid of the motor angle, because what we're really interested in is the movement of the load, not the movement of the motor. And the other thing I'm going to note is that we've got this simple equation, the angular velocity of the motor, omega m, equals d theta m dt. Now, what I did have is I had this equation over here. You remember it was the bottom of the previous page. Above. Okay, so theta m equals 1 over k times k theta l plus b omega l plus j d omega l dt. So what I can do is I can take that theta m here and I can substitute, as you can see here, into omega m here and therefore get rid of it. And you end up with this and you're probably beginning to think, oh no, this really is looking rather messy. But if you just hold on to your hat for a minute, you'll notice that omega m was d theta m dt. So you'll see I've got a d dt term here, and the bit in the brackets here is simply what I had over here. Okay, so I've just substituted it straight in without trying to simplify it, and then written out the rest of the equation as I had before. Now, if I expand this all out, rearrange it, simplify, etc., etc., you end up with this. And this is your final model. So here's an observation. You look at that final model and you say, yeah, OK, it's nice, it's clean. I can see explicitly what the impact is of all these different component values. But it is beginning to get quite messy. All right. And so what are we going to say? It's clear that as we've gradually made our systems more complex, simple ODE methods OK, and writing out the equations and rearranging them and getting ending up with a simple ODV is becoming cumbersome. All right. And really, if you want to do anything more complicated than this, you should be looking at more advanced modeling approaches, not just writing down all the equations from first principles and then trying to rearrange them because it's going to get harder and harder. So it works well for low order, low order systems, but anything beyond about what we've done here, and it's probably going to be too cumbersome. However, we should conclude by saying what's the most important point, OK? Our DC servo has given us a second order ODE. So a DC servo driving a standard load with inertia and a friction gives us second order dynamics. Now, why is this so important? Because there are a huge number of simple applications that use DC servos, so many toys, fans, galvanometers, accelerometers, electric drills, etc., etc. And there may be cases where it's important for you to be able to model these scenarios. What we're going to do in the next video, however, is we're going to say what would happen if we changed some of the assumptions we used in this DC servo model, because we did make very explicit assumptions, and in practice you might want to change those slightly. So we'll explore briefly how the modeling changes if you change some of those assumptions.